Preface to On the Nature of Things. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lenny. On the Nature of Things by Lucretius. Translated by John Selby Watson. Preface. My business has been to give, in the following pages, a literal translation of the six books of Lucretius. This task I have carefully performed, and it will, I trust, be no presumption to say that he who wishes to know what is in Lucretius without perusing the original will learn it from this volume with greater certainty than from any other previously offered to the English reader. The tax immediately followed is that of Forbiger, which may, indeed, be rather called Wakefield's, for the one varies but little from the other. But I have not dismissed a single page of the translation without consulting the texts of Lumbenus, Creech, and Haverkamp, which are substantially the same, and in many instances far more satisfactory than Forbiger's. Concerning all disputed or obscure passages, I have diligently examined the commentators, especially Lumbinus, who is almost instad omnium, Creech and Wakefield, and have added explanatory notes respecting either the subject matter or the translation of particular words or phrases. The words which it has been found necessary to supply are distinguished by italics. Where a participle and a verb, having a similar signification, come together in construction, they have occasionally been rendered as two verbs. Thus, sparsus disicitur will be translated is scattered and dispersed. The particle yam is sometimes omitted, and where a succession of copulative conjunctions occurs, which Lucretius uses superabundantly, one has occasionally been left out in the translation, or been rendered by while, as well as, or in some similar way, for the sake of variety. Any other deviations from the structure of the text, which in the least concern the student, are pointed out in the notes. Tu and tuus, in the addresses of the poet to Memmius, or the general reader, are sometimes translated by thou and thine, and sometimes by you and your. Where Lucretius seem to be particularly earnest, I have adopted the former mode, and in other cases, the latter. J. S. W. Remarks on the Life and Poem of Lucretius Of the life of Lucretius, but little information has reached us. Ad nos vix tenuis famae per labitur aura. That he was a Roman by birth is inferred from the passages in his poem in which he speaks of the Roman world as his country, and of the Roman language as his native tongue. As to the time of his birth, it is stated by Eusebius, in his Chronicon, that he was born in the second year of the hundred and seventy-first Olympiad, or ninety-five years before Christ. At this period, Aeneas had been dead about seventy years. Cicero was in his twelfth year. Twenty-five years were to elapse before the birth of Virgil, and four before that of Julius Caesar. His style, indeed, would make him seem older, but its antiquated character may be partly affected, in imitation, perhaps, of Aeneas, for whom he expresses great veneration. Concerning his family, nothing is known. The name of Lucretius, from the time of Lucretia downwards, occurs frequently in the history of Rome, with the surnames Trisipitinus, Cinna, Ophella, and others attached to it. But with whom the poet was connected, or from whom descended, it is impossible to discover. There was a Lucretius Vespillo, contemporary with him, a senator mentioned by Cicero and Caesar, of whom Lambinus conjectures that he may have been the brother, suggesting that the one brother, by engaging in public life, might have attained senatorial dignity, while the other, devoting himself to literature and retirement, might have continued in the equestrian or even plebeian rank in which he was born. But all this is mere empty conjecture. Equally groundless is the supposition, started also by Lambinus, that in his youth he went to Athens to study, and there, under the instruction of Zeno, who was then at the head of the Epicureans, became imbued with the doctrines of Epicurus. 
that he attached himself to the tenets of Epicurus is certain, but when or where he studied them is not now to be ascertained. Dunlop, however, asserts that Lucretius was sent with other young Romans of rank to study at Athens. Thus it is that errors crept into biography and history, the learned conjecture and the less learned affirm. Lambinus suggests that Lucretius might have gone to Athens. Dunlop states that he did go. Lambinus says that it is probable. Dunlop says it is fact. He wrote his poem, or part of it, as appears from a passage near the beginning of the first book, at a time when the Roman commonwealth was in a disturbed state. But whether the disorders to which he alludes were, as is generally supposed, those excited by Catiline, or, as Forbiger suggests, those which were raised by Claudius eight years afterwards, there is no means of deciding. His poem and his life, if we may trust Eusebius, were ended in the manner following. Having been driven to madness by an amatory potion, and having composed several books in the intervals of his insanity, which Cicero afterwards corrected, he died by his own hand in the forty-fourth year of his age. By whom the potion was administered is conjectured only from a passage in St. Jerome, who says that a certain Lucilia killed her husband or her lover by giving him a filter which was intended to secure his love, but of which the effect was to render him insane. This Lucilia is supposed to have been the wife or mistress of Lucretius, but by whom the supposition was first made I am not able to discover. He is said by Donatus, or whoever wrote the old life of Virgil, to have died on the day on which Virgil assumed the toga virilis. That Cicero corrected what he wrote, there is, except from the passage in Eusebius, no indication. From a passage in Varro, it has been concluded that he wrote many more books than have reached us. For Lucretius, says he, suorum unius et viginti librorum initium fecit hoc, aetheris et terrae genitabile quaerere tempus. But Lambinus has very plausibly conjectured that, for Lucretius, should be substituted Lucilius, or the name of some other writer known to us. This is the more probable, observes Eichstadt, as Varro was older than Lucretius, and was not accustomed to draw examples and testimonies from younger writers. From the six books, as they now stand, there is no inference to be drawn that more were written. That something more was intended is perhaps true, for when we consider how the sixth book breaks off, we must either suppose that he designed to write a conclusion to it, or that he meant another book to follow. It signifies, however, that he was drawing to the conclusion of his undertaking, and indeed the doctrines of Epicurus are so fully set forth in the six books that little more could have been added respecting them. It is true that there are two or three allusions among the grammarians to passages and verses which are not now found in the six books, allusions which have led to the belief that there were more books, but which, with other considerations, led Spalding, the editor of Quintilian, to the suspicion that there were two editions given by the author himself, and that, though the second was generally followed, the first was not quite forgotten. Thus, the 937th verse of the first book, which is now read, Contingunt melis dulci favoque liquore, is cited by Quintilian, Aspirant melis dulci favoque liquore, and Servius, on those lines in the Georgics, Non ego cunta meis amplecti versibus opto, Non mihi si linguae centum sint ora qui centum, fere a vox. Says, the verses are Lucretius's, but he has ainea vox, not ferea, verses which are not now to be found in Lucretius. This notion of two editions Eichstad has noticed at some length in his dissertation De Lucreti Vita et Carmine, and Forbiger has written a long essay to show that Lucretius's verses have been much altered. Fatior enim, says Forbiger, ex quo primum Lucreti Carmen, sudiosius per legerim operam quemeam e inavaverim, plures mihi oblatas esse causas suspicandi, nobis in his sex de rerum natura libris non unius Lucreti, 
seduorum scriptorum longe diversorum manum agnoscendam, ideoque hunc etiam autorem is anumerandum esse, quorum scripta a serioribus multis in locis mutata, auta vel contracta, emendata vel corrupta, denique longe alia ab ea, quam autor ipsis dederit, forma induta, ad nostra tempora pervenerint. I confess that, since I first read the poem of Lucretius with attention, and bestowed serious labor upon it, many reasons occurred to me for suspecting that, in these six books concerning the nature of things, we have to recognize not the hand of Lucretius alone, but those of two writers of far different characters, and that this author is therefore to be numbered with those whose works have come down to us altered in many places by later writers having been augmented or diminished in bulk, amended or corrupted, and invested with a different form from that which the author himself gave them. But perhaps, in the case of Lucretius, the variations which we find in the verses which are cited from him are to be attributed not to any regular revision or emendation of his writings, but to the casual mistakes of transcribers and the lapse of memory in grammarians. Perhaps also passages containing verses cited by Servius and others have been lost. Lachmann, the last editor, finds, or imagines that he finds, deficiencies in several pages. The Memmius to whom the poem is addressed was, as Lambinus and others think, Caius Memius Gemellus, a Roman knight, who is described by Cicero as a learned man, well-read in Greek, but disdainful of Latin literature, a clever orator, and of an agreeable style, but shrinking from the labor, not only of speaking, but even of thinking, and doing injustice to his ability by his want of industry. He became praetor, and after his praetorship had the province of Bithynia, to which he was accompanied by Catullus the poet. Being supported by Caesar, he stood for the consulship, but was unsuccessful, and after being accused and condemned of bribery, went into exile at Petri, where he died. Cicero defended him on his trial, and addressed to him some letters, which may be found in the thirteenth book of his epistles to his friends. The general voice of criticism has awarded to Lucretius high praise as a poet. The earliest notice which we find of his works is that of Cicero, in a letter to his brother Quintus, in which he says, as the passage stands in Ernesti, Lucretii poemata ut scribis ita sunt, non multis luminibus ingenii, Multaitam in artis. The poetry of Lucretius is such as you say, having not much splendor of genius, but a great deal of art. Wakefield would omit the non, but is opposed by Eistad and Schutz and by general opinion. Cicero, however, if we read his words rightly, seems hardly to do justice to the poet, or to hit the general character of his work. To us of the present day, he appears to be chiefly distinguished by a rough vigor and to have been anxious, rather, to express his thoughts strongly than to clothe them in elegance or niceties of language. Not that he disdained poetical beauties, for Virgil and others have found in him many worthy of adoption, but vigor and animation seem to have been his chief aim. Stasius did him more justice when he spoke of the docti furor ardus lucreti, the lofty rage of the learned Lucretius. Ovid thoroughly understood his merit, and predicted that his poem was destined to be immortal. Carmina sublimis tung sunt peritura lucreti, exitio terras, cum dabit una dies. Cornelius Nepus ranks him in elegance with Catullus, for speaking of a certain Julius Calidus, who was rescued from prescription by Pomponius Atticus, he calls him the most elegant poet since the death of Catullus and Lucretius. Quintilian gives him similar praise, saying that he is elegance in sua materia, elegant in his peculiar department, though he thinks him difficult for the student. Aulus Julius calls him a poet excelling in genio et facundia, ingenious and force of language. Serenus Simonicus styles him the great Lucretius, and Valius Paterculus, Vitruvius, Seneca, Macrobius, and Pliny the Younger notice him as ranked among the most eminent poets, though without bestowing on him any specific commendation. 
He is recognized in a similar way by Propertius and Tacitus. There was therefore little cause for Dunlop to complain of the slight mention that is made of Lucretius by succeeding Latin authors, and of the coldness with which he is spoken of by all Roman critics and poets, with the exception of Ovid. Horace, indeed, who makes abundant mention of Aeneas and Lucilius, has, it must be acknowledged, not named Lucretius. Dunlop, to account for this silence of Horace, and the supposed intended silence of others, suggests that the spirit of free thinking which pervaded his writings may have rendered it unsuitable or unsafe to extol his poetical talents. There was a time, he adds, when, in this country, it was thought scarcely decorous or becoming to express high admiration of the genius of Rousseau and Voltaire. With reference to Horace and his times, there may have been some ground for this supposition. Cicero, in his De Amicitia, introduces Lelius, saying that he does not agree with those who have lately begun to assert that souls perish together with their bodies, and that death makes an end of all. I rather submit myself, he continues, to the authority of the ancients, or of our own forefathers, who appointed religious rites for the dead, rites which they would not have instituted, had they thought that the dead could not be affected by them, or to the authority of him who has pronounced by the oracle of Apollo the wisest of men, and who did not on this, as on most subjects, assert sometimes one thing and sometimes another, but maintain invariably the same opinion, that the souls of men are divine, and that, when they are released from the body, a return to heaven is open to them, and first of all to the best and most worthy. But, he concludes, as if unwilling to side too closely with either party, should the opinion of those be true, who think that the soul and the body perish together, and that all sense is terminated by their separation, death will then be attended with neither good nor evil. The moderns have certainly not been less willing to praise Lucretius than the ancients. Barthius and Turnibus commend the attractive simplicity of his antique Latinity. Crinitus and Cosabon speak of his style in a similar manner. And Julius Scaliger calls him a divine man, an incomparable poet. The elegies bestowed upon him by Lambinus, Faber, and his other commentators, I omit, as they might be regarded as the offspring of partiality. Our own countrymen have not been behind others in offering their tribute of admiration, as exhibited in additions, translations, remarks, and quotations. Dr. Wharton, in his essay on Pope, calls the nature of things the noblest descriptive poem extant, and has most happily illustrated the poet's vigor of conception and execution. The Persians, says he, distinguish the different degrees of the strength of fancy in different poets by calling them painters or sculptors. Lucretius, from the force of his images, should be ranked among the latter. He is, in truth, a sculpture poet. His images have a bold relief. If Lucretius had not been spoiled by the Epicurean system, says Lord Byron, he should have had a far superior poem to any now in existence. As mere poetry, it is the first of Latin poems. But the most discriminating and ample praise that has been given him by any English author is that of Dryden. If I am not mistaken, says he, the distinguished character of Lucretius, I mean of his soul and genius, is a certain kind of noble pride and positive assertion of his own opinions. He is everywhere confident of his own reason, and assuming an absolute command, not only over his vulgar readers, but even his patron, Memmius, for he is always bidding him attend, as if he had the rod over him, and using a magisterial authority while he instructs him. He seems to disdain all manner of replies, and is so confident of his cause, that he is beforehand with his antagonists, urging for them whatever he imagined they could say, and leaving them, as he supposes, without an objection for the future. All this, too, with so much scorn and indignation, as if he were assured of the triumph before he entered into the lists. From this sublime and daring genius of his, it must of necessity come to pass that his thoughts must be masculine, full of argumentation, and that sufficiently warm. From the same fiery temper proceeds the loftiness of his expressions, and the perpetual torrent of his verse, 
when the barrenness of his subject does not too much restrain the quickness of his fancy. For there is no doubt to be made, but that he could have been everywhere as poetical as he is in his descriptions, and in the moral part of his philosophy, if he had not aimed more to instruct in his system of nature than to delight. With regard to the subject of his poem, Lucretius is to be contemplated as a natural and moral philosopher. The physical part of his philosophy, and most, indeed, of the moral part, he took from Epicurus, who, as Cicero observes, had previously adopted his physics from Democritus. Of this, the great principle is that nothing can proceed from nothing, and that, consequently, this world in which we live, and every other object in the universe, was formed from matter that previously existed. How this matter came to exist, we need not inquire. We are to suppose that it existed always. In its original state, it was an infinitude of detached atoms, moving or falling through unlimited space, for that space is unlimited is by Lucretius elaborately proved. These atoms are infrangible and indestructible, for matter is not infinitely divisible. There must be a point at which division ends. They are hard and solid, or they would be unable to endure agitation and attrition throughout an infinity of ages. They are of different shapes, suited for the formation of various substances by combination. The number of their forms, however, is limited, but the number of each form is infinite. The atoms were moving, but whence had they the beginning of motion? From their own gravity, for all bodies moved downwards by their own weight. This is the commencement of absurdity in the system. For, if space be infinite, one direction in it cannot be called downwards more than another. As Lucretius himself indeed acknowledges, observing that nil est funditus imum, nor can any reason be assigned why an atom should move from one part of infinite space to another. This commencement of motion, however, being assumed, it is next to be shown how atoms combined. Had they all moved, as might have been supposed, in straight lines, as they fell or proceeded through space, there could have been no coalition among them, unless the heavier had overtaken the lighter. But Lucretius, or Epicurus, had sufficient conception of the motion of bodies in empty space to understand that light bodies must move through it as speedily as heavy ones, and that, consequently, one atom could not overtake another. It was necessary, therefore, to make some of them deviate from the straight or perpendicular line, and it is accordingly assumed that some do deviate from it. This supposition, says Cicero, is mere puerility, for he introduces the deviation arbitrarily. He makes some atoms decline from the straight course without cause, and to say that anything takes place without a cause is, to a natural philosopher, the most disgraceful of all things. To assert, too, that some decline and some go straight onwards is, as it were, to give properties and duties to atoms despotically, determining which is to go in a right line and which obliquely. But when, from partial deviations, some had come in contact with others, they began to form combinations. They strove, as it were, for a long time ineffectually, but at length the larger and heavier atoms coalesced into the denser substances, as earth and water, the smaller and lighter into more subtle matters, as air and fire. From combinations of such substances arose plants and animals, as trees and worms still spring from the earth when it is moistened and warmed. Of the rise of animals in general, and of men specially, the reader will find an ample account, according to the notions of Epicurus, in the fifth book. Nature does not abhor a vacuum. On the contrary, it is necessary that there should be, throughout the whole of matter, certain portions of empty space, or the movement of particles would be utterly impeded. Water, for instance, could not be a liquid, unless there were vacuities among its atoms to allow them to yield to pressure. Man consists of a body and a soul. The body is constituted of coarser, and the soul of finer matter. Both are produced together, and grow up and decay together. 
at death, the connection between them is dissolved. The soul takes its departure to be decomposed and mingled with other matter, and the body begins to decay that it may undergo a similar fate. The mind is intimately connected with the soul, so intimately that they must be said to form one substance. Both are composed of heat, vapor, air, and a certain fourth substance, which has no name, but which is the most important of the four, as being the origin of motion in the whole man. That both are wholly corporeal is indisputable, from their power to act on the body. Tangere nim et tangi nisi corpus nulla potest res. Ideas of objects in the mind are produced by the mysterious action of images of things on the soul and intellect, images of a light vapory substance, which are perpetually passing off from the surface of all bodies whatsoever, and exhibiting the exact resemblance of the objects from which they are detached. Other images, too, are formed spontaneously in the atmosphere, as we see clouds, at times, form themselves into likenesses of things on the face of the sky. Of images, accordingly, the number is infinite, so that, whenever a man wishes to think on anything, the image of it is generally ready to present itself for his contemplation. If he cannot recollect what he wishes to think on, he may consider that an image of it is not at hand. Dreams are excited by images, which, as they pass through the air, penetrating the coverings of the body, come in contact with such atoms of the soul as are at the surface of the body, and thus communicate their impressions to the whole of the soul and mind. Vision is produced by the same images flying off from the surface of the objects at which we look, and striking on the eye. Reflection from mirrors and other smooth surfaces is produced by the image first striking the reflecting plane and then being reverberated to the eye. Voice, like all sounds, is a corporeal substance, because it frequently, as it passes forth, causes abrasion of the throat, and because much speaking exhausts the corporeal frame by detraction of atoms. The members and organs of the body were not formed with a design that they might be used, for there could have been no design in the offspring of fortuitously meeting atoms. But as they have been formed, and we find them capable of being used, we apply them, accordingly, to the uses for which they seem adapted. The feet were not formed for walking, but as we find they enable us to walk, we employ them in walking. Of all our knowledge the foundation must rest on the perceptions of our senses. To our senses we can assuredly trust, for what shall refute them? Will anything distinct from them refute them, or will they refute one another? That which shall convict them of falsehood must be more trustworthy than they. But what can be more trustworthy? What shall convince us that those bodies which appear to the senses square, or hot, or black, are not possessed of those qualities? The motions and combinations of atoms being established, all natural phenomena, as thunder, lightning, rain, earthquakes, are easily shown to arise from their changes of place and effects on one another. Even were it not demonstrable that the world was fortuitously formed by the coalescence of atoms, it might yet be safely affirmed, from the numerous faults apparent in it, and from the various causes of suffering to animal life which it contains, that it was not made by divine wisdom as an abode for living creatures. It sprung into being casually, and animals that casually sprung from it make the best of that abode to which they are confined, and from which there is no release but death. This world which we inhabit is not the only one in the universe. The number of atoms being infinite, it is naturally to be supposed that they must have produced more worlds than one. It is therefore probable that there are many worlds of many kinds. And as these worlds have been generated, we may fairly argue that they also decay. Men, other animals, and the trees of the forest are born but to die. And why should not a world be subject to the same fate as the things which grow in it? We see, indeed, the symptoms of decadence in the world which we inhabit, for the present productions of the earth are not of the same vigor as those of its earlier days. All, then, around us, we may conclude, is making progress towards dissolution, 
the great blow will continue to sink and grow infirm, until at last, mouldering and disruptured, it scatters its atoms through surrounding space to contribute to the formation of other worlds, like or unlike itself. Star after star from heaven's bright arch shall rush, suns sink on suns, and systems systems crush, headlong, extinct, to one dark censure fall, and death and night and chaos mingle all, till, o'er the wreck, emerging from the storm, immortal nature lifts her changeful form, mounts from her funereal pyre on wings of flame, and soars and shines another and the same. Darwin Such were the general tenets of Lucretius as a natural philosopher, tenets on which the reader will find him amply enlarging in the following pages. His doctrines as a moral philosopher may be noticed with greater brevity. His great boast as a moralist was that he freed men from the terrors of death and of suffering after death. The soul, says he, when it is separated from the body, is dispersed among the matter from which it was collected, and the man ceases to be. His atoms continue to exist, for they are indestructible, but his own existence as an individual being is no more. He is separated into his parts, and his consciousness that he ever existed as a whole is at an end. Of what has been, he will have no recollection. Of what shall be, he will have no knowledge. Why then should he dread to die, when after death no suffering can ensue? He that is about to die young may felicitate himself that he shall escape that trouble and affliction of which some falls to the lot of every man. He that dies at an advanced age may be satisfied that he has had so long opportunity for those enjoyments of which no man fails to obtain some. After a certain period, life offers nothing new, and why should we seek to prolong it? The greatest enjoyment of life consists in tranquil pleasure. To labor for honor and dignities, which are unsatisfactory when attained, is mere folly. Nature has supplied everything necessary to satisfy our wants, and to enable us to spend our existence in ease, contentment, and pleasure if we only study the best method of making the most of what is set before us. A wise man can live on a little, and to live contentedly on a little is to be equal in enjoyment to him who has more than ourselves, and who, however much he may have, can have no solid satisfaction unless he is contented with that which he possesses. The highest degree of wisdom that we can attain is to be able to look down from the serene elevations of philosophy, on the unreasoning crowds wandering beneath us, seeking for the path of happiness, and vainly hoping to find it in the pursuit of the splendors and distinctions of the world. Whether he really believed in the existence of gods, that is, of beings of a similar but superior nature to ourselves, it is not easy, from the perusal of his works to decide. He at times speaks of gods, like Epicurus, as certainly existing, and enjoying a state of tranquil felicity, unconcerned about the affairs of the world, and unaffected by human good or human evil. At other times he seems to consider them as mere creatures of the imagination, to which men have attributed, in the operations of nature, those effects of which they cannot discover the causes. The first edition of Lucretius was printed at Bresses, by Ferrandus, without date, but, as Wakefield and others think, about the year 1470. It is of all Editiones Principes the most rare. The second edition appeared at Verona, printed by Freidenperger, in 1486, and the third at Venice, by T. de Ragazzonibus, in 1495. From Venice, too, in 1500, came forth the first edition of Aldus, and fifteen years afterwards the second, superintended by Naugerius, who did more to make his author intelligible than had been done in the former edition. In the meantime, however, 1511, had appeared at Bononia the edition of Baptista Pius, who brought much learning and ability to bear upon his author, and many of whose notes are still worthy of preservation. To have been greatly improved from the revised text of Michael Marullus, which was published from his manuscripts after his death by Petrus Candidus, whose name the edition bears, 
at Florence in 1512, of which text succeeding editors have overlooked the merits or have been unwilling to do justice to them. But all other editions were thrown into the shade by those of Lambinus, of which the first appeared in 1563, the second in 1565, and the third in 1570. Of all editors and expounders of Lucretius, Lambinus still deserves to stand at the head. He is accused by Wakefield of inconsulta temeritas, injudicious rashness, and intruding his own conjectures into the text, and by Eichstadt of having had too high an opinion of his own judgment and ability. But though there be some grounds for such accusations, his character as an editor is still of the highest order. He brought to his work a powerful mind, and knowing that Lucretius always intended to write sense, he took upon himself to put sense, perhaps at times too arbitrarily, into verses which had been left meaningless by transcribers. And it is surely no dishonor to him to have shown his contempt for such a man as Giphanius, who, in 1565, printed an edition at Antwerp, and whose annotations have little other claim to notice than that of stacking Lambinus with the meanness with which a low mind always attacks a higher. There were some other editions, but of not much account, between Giphanius's and that of Tanaqui Faber, which was published in 1662, containing notes, brief indeed, but evincing the great learning and acuteness of the editor. To Faber, in 1695, succeeded Creech. His text is Lambinus's with scarcely any variation, and though he never fails to expose a mistake of Lambinus when he finds one in his commentary, he is very ready to profit by all Lambinus's instructions. His interpretatio, after the manner of the Delphin editions, is of little use, for wherever there is any difficulty of construction, he invariably abbreviates. Yet, if we may credit the last editor, Lachmann, multa rectius interpretatus est quam scripsit in philosophia explicanda sane diligens, sed linguae latinae impeditissimus. This is too strong, but there are in his notes inelegances and inaccuracies. In 1725 appeared the splendid edition of Haverkamp, which is extremely useful as containing all the notes of Lambinus, Giphanius, Greech, and Faber, with a selection from those of Pius, and with a few of considerable value from Abrahamus Praegerus, a friend of Haverkamp. Of Haverkamp's own there is comparatively little. At length, in 1796, came out, with a dedication to Fox, the well-known edition of Wakefield. Wakefield had discovered, by the inspection of a manuscript or two, that Lambinus had taken, as he thought, unjustifiable liberties with the text of Lucretius, and conceived that he should be enabled to restore it to something like its original integrity. Had he been content to reinstate only those words or phrases which Lambinus or others had unreasonably ejected, he might have done greater service, but he replaced also such readings as any editor would have been blamed for suffering to remain. I will give one instance. In Lambinus and Creech, the 863rd verse of the third book stands thus. Interrupta semel cum sit repetentia nostra. Repetentia nostra, our memory or recollection. This is intelligible, but Wakefield, finding in manuscripts nostris, replaced it as a crux to his reader, who, as soon as he comes to it, is stuck fast. What, he inquires, is to be understood with nostris? It is vain to seek for anything in what precedes, and he must consult Wakefield's notes to find that, according to Wakefield's notion, rebus must be supplied. How much the difficulties in an author may be increased by such changes is easily conceivable. But he who has only read Lambinus or Creech's edition of Lucretius can have no conception how much the difficulties in Lucretius have been increased by Wakefield's arbitrary alterations. Whether Wakefield ever construed through a brick wall I do not know, but that he has raised abundance of brick walls through which others are left to construe is manifest. There is in his notes, besides other unnecessary matter, a vast quantity of superfluous railing 
at the inscitia and inverecundia of Lambinus, and the inscitia and stupor of Creech, of which the reader may see an average specimen on 6582, and in various other places. A man worthy to edit Lucretius should have forborne to apply the term inscitia to such a predecessor as Lambinus. In 1801, Wakefield's text was reprinted at Leipzig by Eichstadt, who had previously obtained repute by his edition of Diodorus Siculus. The first volume, containing the text of the six books, Judicius Prolegomena, in an excellent index, is the only one that has appeared. In 1828 came for the edition of Forbiger, which, chiefly perhaps from the convenience of its size, has been much used. His text is Wakefield's, with but very few alterations, and all his explanations of passages are Wakefield's. His work, says Lachman, was mercenary, and it would be doing him great injustice to suppose him capable of seeing anything by the light of his own intellect. In 1850, at Berlin, appeared Lachman's edition, in two thin volumes octavo. He is a little too fond of transposing verses, and discovering deficiencies in the text, but deserves great commendation for restoring many readings that Wakefield had ejected. His notes are not at all explanatory, but are wholly occupied about changes in the text. With regard to versions of Lucretius, the earliest attempt to render him into English was made by John Evelyn, the author of Silva, who, in 1656, published the first book in verse with a commentary. His lady designed the frontispiece, and Waller prefixed a copy of verses. The translation is faithful, but tame. In 1682 was published a translation by Creech, which, as the first complete version of the poet, was cordially welcomed. Evelyn furnished some laudatory couplets, saying how much he was pleased that the entire work had fallen to more vigorous hands than his own. Duke, Tate, and Otway gave also their tribute of verse, and Creech was everywhere known as the English Lucretius. But posterity have had time to discover the faults in his performance. Many of his lines are vigorous, but many are stiff and awkward, and the licenses which he has taken with the original are almost beyond belief. Whoever will look at the commencement of his first book will find that between the tenth and sixteenth verses he inserts five lines of his own. Similar interpolations may be found in other places, and he likewise curtails with equal freedom whenever it suits his purpose. About the same time Dryden produced some translations, or rather paraphrases, of particular passages, executed with his usual vigor. In 1743, there appeared, in two volumes octavo, a prose translation, which Good calls Garnier's, but which was the work of an unknown hand. Garnier, with others, furnished the plates. The version is but indifferent. Some parts of it, though printed as prose, run into blank verse. In 1799 the first book was translated in rhyme by an anonymous author, and in 1808, also in rhyme, by the Rev. W. Hamilton Drummond. Both versions have merit, but the greater share of praise belongs to Mr. Drummond. In 1805, Dr. Good laid before the public his two quarto volumes, containing a version of the whole poem in blank verse, with copious notes. This translation is in general pleasing and animated, but some parts are rather stiff. Taken as a whole, it is by far the best extant, and is deemed by my publisher a desirable addition to the present volume. In 1813, was published by subscription, in two pompous volumes quarto, the rhymed version of Thomas Busby, Music Doctor. He is, to do him justice, tolerably faithful to the sense, but his couplets are far inferior to those of Mr. Drummond's first book. His notes are heavy and tedious, and all his learning second-hand. The whole book reminds the reader of the commencement of his well-known prologue, which Lord Byron, says Moore, unnecessarily travestied. When energizing objects men pursue, what are the prodigies they cannot do? In French, Lucretius has been translated several times. The earliest version is that of the Abbé de Marolles, in prose, published in 1650, which has not obtained more esteem than his other translations of classical authors. In 1685, another prose translation was published by the Baron de Couture, which is paraphrastic, 
but seems tolerably faithful to the sense. In 1768, Lagrange published a third, which gives the thoughts of the poet with exactness, but wants vigor and animation. And in 1794, Le Blanc de Guillet brought out a fourth, in verse, which I have not minutely examined, but on which his countrymen set no very high value. The last, in 1825, was that of Pougerville, in prose, rather a paraphrase than a translation, and preserving nothing of the sententiousness of Lucretius. The Italian version of Marchetti, in blank verse, published in London 1717, and since several times reprinted, has always been highly esteemed. The Germans have three translations, one by Meyer, 1784, in prose, which Degen, cited by Moss, calls pretty accurate, another by Meinecke, 1795, in examiner verse, which is generally considered faithful to the sense, and the last by Gnebel, 1821, which is also in examiner verse, and which is the most highly valued of the three. The Dutch have a prose translation by De Witt, printed in 1701, which Good says that he had seen, but without being induced to imitate it. I beg leave to observe that, in the notes attached to the following translation, I have not taken upon me to refute any of the doctrines of Lucretius or Epicurus. To have offered formal refutations of them would have occupied more space than could be afforded in the present volume, and many of them, in these days, require no refutation. I have, therefore, restricted myself to discharging that which Dryden admonishes me to be the duty of a translator, to do my author all the right I can, and to translate him to the best advantage. Those who seek for arguments against his tenets, physical or moral, may find them in Lactantius, in Arnobius, in the anti lucretius of Cardinal Polignac, in the Bridgewater Treatises, and in abundance of other English books. The famous refutation by Cardinal Polignac, called anti lucretius I might have quoted in every page, and the reader will perhaps wonder that I have not done so. But I forbore to quote him, as I forbore to quote others. He assailed Lucretius with great determination. His versification, though, deficient in Lucretian order, is always respectable, and sometimes elevated, and he would perhaps be more read, had he not unluckily, as Voltaire observes, when he attacked Lucretius, attacked Newton. End of Remarks on the Life and Poem of Lucretius